Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Um, my name is Victoria Vanova, and I am R&D Strategic Lead at Serpentine. Uh, welcome to the first event of the Legal Lab Live series, uh, organized together with the principal investigator of Serpentine's Legal Lab, Alana Kushner. Hi, Hi Alana. Hi, Victoria. Just a few words about Alana and the Legal Lab uh, for everybody's background. So Alana has been leading the Legal Lab since its inception in 2019. Um, the mission of the Legal Lab is to develop research, insights, and practical approaches to how the law can better support artistic engagements and particularly experimentation with advanced technologies. Um, while uh, we advocate for the law to be approached as a creative organizational medium that can be of great value in expanding artistic agency in technological spaces. We're also interested in how art that engages with technology can challenge and transform the law. And so the specific series, Legal Lab Life series, on art law and the metaverse will be looking at both sides of this equation. So with this in mind, this first event today uh, will be dedicated to the topic of artists and cultural organizations' creative agency in the metaverse. And, you know, we're defining the metaverse in a very loose way um, as an increasingly kind of complex, spatially organized virtual environments that may or may not be integrated into a digital asset economy. And today's session is about laying the foundations of what it means to talk about artists' rights on a very practical level within this context. Uh, further Legal Lab Live sessions will zoom in on different areas that are specific to Metaverse, Web3, and the law. And we will be inviting innovative thinkers and practitioners to join us in these conversations. So, Alana, to start out, um, could you please provide an overview of the key challenges from your perspective that the context of the Metaverse and Web3 technologies pose to, the, to practitioners, artistic practitioners, from a legal perspective, and why does this matter? Sure. Well, I'm not going to lie. It's a bit of a legal minefield when it comes to Web3 and legal challenges. In fact, I think that every day it goes by, I'm always thinking about some new potential issue that can occur. Um, but, you know, the way I would think about these challenges is in different types of um, thematic blocks, let's say. And Victoria, I think we've got a diagram on yep. the shift from analog law to tech-driven law that we can use to yeah, help here. break down some of those thematic Do we blocks. have the diagram up? Yeah, yeah great. Uh, so yeah, so these are these are kind of different themes, thematic <laughs> challenges around legal issues in Web3. Um, the first one I wanted to mention is around this shift from state-based regulation to community-led regulation. So, you know, traditionally we see laws or rules which govern a community or a society being initiated um, by the government of the day. Uh, but what we see in the world of Web3 is more community-led regulation. And this can happen at multiple levels. So, for example, one level is the regulation of a DAO. And the rules with you know underneath which that DAO operates that the Alana, DAO community sets up. I'm gonna I'm going to be very annoying and ask you to define what a DAO is, or at least. To oh no! <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to define it, but just a uh, decentralized <laughs> autonomous organization for those. Yeah, yeah, for those yeah, yeah. You. No, no, no. I was just joking. Um, decentralized autonomous organization. Um, so it's a it's a it's a type of an organizational structure that relies on blockchain technology to operate. And so a lot of, some of the decision-making processes of that organization can be automated by way of the blockchain. Um, and so that allows a tech-driven way of regulating the community. How, do, how, how is that, Victoria? That's perfect. That sounds good. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So next, moving on to the next, the, the grouping, we've got physical assets versus intangible assets. Now, of course, this is sort of taking it to the extremes. And, you know, I think we all could agree that intangible assets have already existed pre-Web3 and the metaverse. Um, and we actually have um, laws in place which govern intangible assets, primarily intellectual property laws. But I think now what we're seeing is that there's more of a focus on these intangible assets um, and intangible assets that can be quite complicated. And 
really when we're talking about intangible assets here, you know, it could be anything of, of value that's not tangible in nature. So it could be cryptocurrencies, it could be NFTs, but it's not specific necessarily to blockchain technology. So it could be software, it could be code, it could be digital music, um, videos, data held in digital form. Um, so, so that's another kind of a shift in focus that, that we're seeing. Something that also would really like to cover more in this series is this shift from proprietary ownership to permissive ownership. And so I think, you know, when, when you think of the metaverse, um, these types of, or, you know, the definitions of the metaverse, they tend to be focused on a shift to more um, equitable user ownership or user-oriented ownership of digital assets and their underlying technology. Um, and so this is where I'm heading with this shift in concepts from proprietary ownership to permissive ownership as well. Um, so I think we can cover that in a bit more, uh, a bit later in the session. And, may I just and finally ask... also, oh, yeah, go on. Go on. Sorry. <laughs> we will get to very organic exchange by maybe <laughs> Legal Labs uh, live session 25. But for now, <laughs> um, just wanted to ask about this focus on ownership because it, it's not just a question of kind of um you know property rights it's more it's a question of also kind of user rights and what you can do with uh, a digital asset or with a work of art right and how you can organize certain business models around it uh in the short term midterm and long term so yeah, could you kind of explain a little bit more why are we why are we focusing so much on ownership? Is it correct that it's because that's what allows us to really plan around some kind of economic or business model uh, side of uh, the existence of the artwork? Yeah, absolutely. or is it more well, than just I the think, business model? <laughs> I think you know it's interesting. I was even listening to a podcast the other day from Right Click Save, and um, the artists on on the podcast were talking about how. In the metaverse, they can own their IP. And I just thought that was such an interesting concept in a way, even though you know, we've been owning things from, you know, a pen or a book or a physical house for so many years. So this concept of ownership is something that, um, you know, I think we're all very familiar with. Um, but I think you can contrast that to how um, we've operated as beings within Web two, let's say, and um, that that's where essentially you know we are kind of sharing our data, sharing our information, sharing our IP, um, in order to have an audience, in order to be part of a community, um, and the idea with Web three though is um, we don't have to give up those rights anymore. Um, we are the ones that produce it and and we own it as well. Um, when we're thinking about ownership also, I think it's also important to think of, um, you know, what it gives you the ability to do. Um, and, and that is really, it gives you the rights to whatever asset you're creating um, in a way that's exclusive to anybody else. So you have the exclusive right to sell that asset or well, you have the exclusive right to share that asset. And, and, and that sharing of the asset is where the permissive IP comes from. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I guess it's not then just, I was incorrect in some ways, it's not just about business models, but it's also about understanding how one wants one's artwork to circulate, uh, who one wants to share the kind of circulation value with uh, and how the relationships, you know, of all the parties that produce the work uh, can be shaped and articulated, uh, you know, for the duration of this work's presence within like a metaverse context. Which, which I think effectively can be a business model, okay. but it doesn't have to be seen as a business model. Okay. Business model plus. Okay, great. So there's there's one more category left within this uh, list. So <laughs> yes, so I've that. written down written contracts and shifting to automated contracts. Of course, again, you know this is really 
looking at extremes here, but um, I do think we are seeing a shift from you know traditional long form written contracts to automated contracting processes, not for all relationships, but for some and for those that make sense. Um, and, and so that's the contractual side of being in the Middle West. Um, great. So let's maybe loop back now that you've expanded a little bit on why this concept of ownership is important. Uh, what can be legally owned in the metaverse? Well, if we're thinking about intangible property, right? So when we think of intangible property, like I mentioned, we're primarily looking at area of local intellectual property. And intellectual property is really an umbrella term for multiple um, subsets of IP. Um, and it's really another way to think of IP, another way to describe is a kind of a bundle of rights, which are given to a person over you know, creations of the mind. Uh, and I'll come back to this idea of creations of the mind, because I think we'll look at human authorship as well. Um, but as you can see on, on this diagram here, we've just indicated some of the many different subcategories of intellectual property. So when we talk about owning IP or sharing an IP, it's actually a lot of different types of um, rights that that can involve. So there could be copyrights, uh, and copyrights generally protect, you know, visual elements, artistic works, literary works, musical works. We also have trademarks, which can protect logos or symbols generally. We also have patents, which uh, protect inventions. We have designs. Designs is an interesting category because it depends on um, the jurisdiction you're in, in terms of how that's categorised. Sometimes it's actually grouped under copyrights as well. So in the UK, for example, your copyright legislation also covers designs. I've also covered here moral rights, which is not a form of intellectual property as such, but it's a kind of a, a cousin mm. of copyright as such, and moral right being, you know, the right to be attributed as the author of the work, um, the right to not have your work treated in a derogatory way. And I've also covered trade secrets. I think, you know, when it comes to the metaverse, lots of us are thinking about ideas and pitching ideas and um, usually the way in which the law categorises ideas that haven't been expressed in a in a material way is as trade secrets or confidential information so that also like moral rights is not really a category of intellectual property but it's often thought of in, in tandem with intellectual property so, so takeaway point with um what you can own is there are lots of different things you can own when it comes to IP. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you know you will have a trademark or a patent, you might have a copyright. Um, sometimes it can be hard to tell which category something will fall in. Okay, so I guess maybe let's um, land this in a specific example. So let's say I create a digital artwork. Um, how would that be seen in the eyes of the law? I think here we can use Danielle's work to so this is a really interesting work to talk through in terms of this question of what do you own when you own uh, IP um, and that's because of the multiple kind of layers of IP protection that would exist with this work so you can contrast it to, for example, a painting or, you know, maybe a 3D sculpture made out of clay. Um, those types of traditional forms of art making tend to fall within one specific category under um, the copyright laws. Um, but with Danielle's work, um, really it falls under many different categories of copyright and many different categories of IP more de generally. Uh, and so in Danielle's work here, we've got, you know, 2D images um, and that would be considered an artistic work under the copyright laws. You've got these 3D renderings, which are probably more akin to like a 
film or cinematograph fix film, which is actually a different category of copyright protection. Um, it's also built on a game engine. Um, and so there you've got this kind of licensing considerations you should be thinking about. Um, she's also um, um, used facial scanning, um, which are implemented in these 3D renderings. So there's this pre-existing content there. There's text animations that are integrated into it and could be, you know, categorised as literary works. Um, you've also got this kind of live performance that took place on Twitch and um, that was recorded. And so that recording itself forms like another asset, another digital asset, another layer of IP. And, and the reason also I should say it's important to dig down and work out like which category of IP your work might be protected by is because that affects what your exclusive rights are as the IP owner. They're not exactly the same for all different categories of IP. It really depends on um, that specific category that they fall under. So, so takeaway I point is multiple layers of copyrights. Um, and each, and also each layer can be authored and owned by a different person or entity. So effectively, there are two lists here. So there are different types of cop of intellectual IP law that attaches to different levels of the work, but then there are also different potentially. I mean, how would you then describe the the different layers? Uh, are there different elements of the work that need to be made discreet in order to understand um, what IP could attach to what layer? Uh, or is it more about kind of understanding the overarching artwork as a specific you know, type of uh, entity that then has like a subset of uh, um, IP questions attached to it because of the levels? Do you know what I mean? So like there is sort of, is it is it just an artwork with different IP uh, categories attached to it, or is it actually a series of different assets, digital assets that uh, can be uh, disentangled from one another? It's actually both. So you it's could both. call you could call each layer a different asset, and that's why you can actually um, license it on different terms to other layers within the artwork as well. So I think we actually had another diagram, a more copyright specific mm. diagram, which I think will also help make sense of these kind of layers. So we've got our yeah. hypothetical artwork and you can see here these, these types, different types of assets um, that, that fall under the artwork and each have their own copyright that attaches to it effectively okay. and so this is a really so much more complicated than a traditional artwork um and you know even looking at like the middleware there as well like that's that's the aspect that could be licensed from or could be pre-existing um it could be a literary work you know code is actually seen as a literary work for the purpose of the copyright yeah, actually, on this note, on the note of uh, code and authorship, what about generative art? Um, how does it work when AI is involved in the actual creation process, when it's not just like an individual artist author? I mean, I think this is a really interesting question. Um, there's not really much of a legal response yet in terms of um, you know, guidance from um, you know, legislation or courts for that matter. Um, but you know what we do know in, in, in um, most jurisdictions um, is that the author of a work is considered the first owner of the IP in that work. Um, but in order for the law to recognize that owner, that owner has to be a legally recognised person or a legal entity. So, you know, in other words, only a legally recognised person can enforce intellectual property rights. Um, so a DAO 
that is not a legal entity that's incorporated in a specific jurisdiction, um, that's not going to be recognised as having legal personhood. So a DAO can't in- enforce IP rights. Um, because it's not recognised in the eyes of the law as being able to own or possess IP rights. Um, It's the members of the DAO who could jointly own the assets, but it's an important distinction. Um, So we're seeing these concepts around authorship really being challenged when it comes to the metaverse. Um, And like you've asked, when it comes to generative art, where you have AI or machine learning involved, you know, these questions of who is the author um, are really difficult for the law to comprehend uh, because, you know, IP law wasn't designed when AI or machine learning was a concept. And, you know, we're especially seeing that actually being played out in the context of patent laws specifically. And in patent law, there's a concept of an inventor Um, And there are a number of judgments um, from different jurisdictions around the world, recent judgments, where the courts have actually had to consider whether um, an AI machine can be an inventor. Um, And on the screen, you can actually see one of the diagrams that was included in this patent application. I mean, it might look kind of fancy and cool, but really this is actually just an invention for a food container and a device related to food containers. <laughs> but um, the story goes is that the, the doctor who invented this um, these food container devices and, and methods, um, it, he invented these based on an AI system called Davos. And um, and uh, the, this um, and this uh, person, Dr. Thaler, he he listed Davis, the AI system, as the inventor when he was applying for the patents. And you know, lo and behold, of course, the application was rejected in his very many jurisdictions. So he applied for an international patent. So it was considered in a number of different jurisdictions, um, and it was rejected on the basis that the inventor was not a person. And, you know, to gain patent protection, the inventor needs to be a human or a legally recognised entity like a company. Um, But I think the reason why, you know, in Australia, for example, when, um, when the courts considered the case here, it's not that they didn't want to agree that an AI system could be an inventor. It's more that they felt that that was a policy question that it was for the government of the day to decide Um, and so they said that you know like the courts it's not really ultimately up to them to decide whether an AI system can be recognized as an inventor so I think the takeaway point when it comes to generative art um, and to AI and authorship really is watch this space Um, we are high it's highly likely that we're going to see more AI systems tested in the courts in and the legislature in the future so we'll see we'll see where it goes okay super exciting um let's get back to the idea of user ownership so on what legal basis can one use digital assets in the metaverse well so when we think of use we have to think of um two concepts a license or an assignment um and I think we have oh, kind of a basic diagram around the Simon yeah, license. Here, it is. here we go. So there's two ways in which you can kind of um, use a digital asset if it's not yours. Um, one is it can be transferred to you or sold to you. And so in legal speak, that's called an assignment. The other is um, you can get permission to use it. And that's called a license. Um, Just one point to note here, and this is like quite a specific legal point, is that when it comes to an assignment of a digital asset, particularly an IP protected asset, in some jurisdictions, um, including the UK, um, the assignment actually needs to be in writing and it has to be signed by the person who is actually transferring the asset. Um, And so unless it's executed in this very formal way, then the law will not necessarily recognise that assignment as being legit. So just remember to keep in mind that the law still applies to the metaverse. 
Um, and just because we're facing these, you know, new frontiers doesn't mean that these old legal concepts don't apply. Um, and then, so when it comes to licenses, which is like quite a, a big topic in itself, um, there are essentially two different types of, of licenses. There are exclusive ones. So this is where you give someone exclusive permission to, to use that asset or non-exclusive. So you can share that asset with multiple um, people. And, yes, yeah, so here we get stuck into the, the nitty-gritty of licenses. So you can see you've got exclusive or non-exclusive. And then under non-exclusive, you've got all these different variations of licenses. And I've called them either closed or or open. So you can have specific license arrangements that you're negotiating one-on-one -on -one with the person that you're you know, borrowing the asset from. Um, so, you know, for example, with Danielle's work, um, you know, that would have granted the Serpentine um, a license to, to show the, the, um, the work as part of the live event on Twitch. Um, but, um, you know, and, and, you know, that could even have been an exclusive license. I don't know. I'm just playing <laughs> play here. Um, but it could have been exclusive. So, you know, a certain time I said, we'll, we'll, we'll show this work of yours, but you can't show it with any other institution, you know, at least for the next year or two years or whatever it is. So that's the kind of exclusivity I mean. Um, but it's also why the contract becomes really important because your contract or your license agreement, that really spells out the scope of your license. So I guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is there's no one size all when it comes, one size fits all when it comes to a license. There's all many variations and you can really play with the scope of that license and who has the right to do what. And, and that's again where your contract sort of becomes a tool where you can spell um, that out as well. Um, just a couple of other examples of, you know, type, types of licensing arrangements that, you know, we'll see, we've seen in Web2 and, and will come about with Web3 as well. Um, but you've got your terms and conditions. So let's say you've got an NFT platform um, and a marketplace. They will have their terms of service that apply to a, a user's use of that platform. And so, you know, those are kind of take it or leave it. They're bare licenses. They're, they're take it or leave it approaches to licensing. There's no room to negotiate when you're using an NFT platform's website, generally, so to speak. Um, and this is also where you get into Creative Commons. So Creative Commons is you know, a type of a licensing arrangement where you're effectively giving the world the right to use your asset on certain conditions like attribution or share alike, for example. Um, I also thought, you know, I, I also thought we could also cover, you know, software licenses in particular, because again, this is a type of a licensing arrangement that, you know, most artists probably are not taught about in art school. Um, but it's becoming more and more common as something that's going to come up, you know, as part of your daily practice when you're working with software, of course. Um, and I'll back there. Yeah, so software licenses. So again, we can have like very specific software licenses or you can have these open, bare, take it or leave it. Um, type of licenses and this is where we get into the concept of copyleft and permissive IP so these are concepts around licensing that specifically evolved around software but what I've been noticing um, working in this space is that they've become sort of used more generally outside of software specific applications so I think that's quite an interesting space yeah. to to look out for no, absolutely. I guess that kind of connects to what I was trying to say in the beginning that um, there is like a particular particular kind of innovation, right, that can be brought in through uh, 
artistic experimentation with advanced technologies if we take the legal side seriously and the innovation then kind of becomes you know oriented towards uh, the practice of law itself which is why um, I think you know very much our school of thought is that uh, the law should be used from you know the very beginning of the project as really kind of a creative medium to uh, explore the potential developmental trajectories of each um, artistic project. So in terms of this kind of shift from analog law to non-state-based kind of regulation models, um, can you expand on this? I mean, wh what does this mean, I guess, in relationship to enforceability, uh, which is ultimately, you know, the reason why, <laughs> in theory, you know, apart from the kind of organizational dimension, but enforceability is also the reason why we have uh, the law and why we rely on it, or the possibility of enforceability. Yeah, well, one of the comments about the metaverse I hear very often is there's no regulation. It's the wild west, there's no regulation. And I don't think that's necessarily true. Um, I think you could consider this the, the realm of regulation and enforcement in the metaverse as more of a, you know, sliding spectrum. Um, and actually, yes, yeah, so we come up with a diagram to describe this sliding spectrum. So on, on the far left, you have your analog or traditional law approach um, of regulation and, and well, I shouldn't say so much regulation, but enforcement. So you have your court systems, your court structures, where the courts will determine the outcome of a dispute between two or more parties. It's pretty straightforward, pretty non-accessible to your average artist. Um, it's uh, very costly. Um, it's very time consuming. It's very resource intensive. Um, and it's just not something that most average people, artists or non-artists, can, yeah. can, can access. And that's actually why still sort of on the analog law side, um, over the last two decades or so, this concept of ADR or alternative dispute resolution developed to recognize that kind of lack of access and the barriers to entry of the traditional court systems. And this is where we get to um, enforcement arrangements around arbitration, so like tribunals, uh, which don't sort of have the standing of a court, but still have the authority to bind what um, you know, the two parties might um, be able to do or not do. Mediation as well, where you have a mediator that mediates a dispute. But then I think as we go more, you know, across to the right-hand side, that's where things get kind of more, you know, interesting and perhaps still slightly unusual when it comes to enforceability in the metaverse. Um, we've kind of seen what I would call a bit of a streamlining approach when it comes to um, dealing with infringing content in particular. Um, and so many um, entities that host third party content on their websites, so like NFT platforms, for example, they use what's called the DMCA takedown notice approach. Now, the DMCA takedown notice approach is actually something that's come out of US copyright law, which actually spells out this process for um, copyright holders to get user content that's uploaded and that infringes their copyright taken off of websites. Um, and basically, for those who don't know, the process involves a copyright owner um, sending a takedown notice to it could be the platform, it could be um, it could be the internet service provider, the ISP, um, it could be the search engine, so like Google or a web host, so you know like Squarespace, if that's what the website's hosted on, you know, or other type of online site operator. Um, and under US law, when it comes to this DMCA process, there's several elements that you you have to include. Um, and basically, if you don't include them, then, then that service provider might refuse to take down the material. But yeah, so what I've noticed, interestingly, I think, is that this kind of DMCA notice approach, it's being used by website owners who aren't necessarily based in the US either. So it's become a kind of a global strategy. Um, so yeah, even though it's, it's not necessarily a, a compulsory 
legal requirement. Um, what else? So social media outing, um, very controversial still. And, you know, what I'm alluding to here in particular is where artists rely on outing individuals and platforms who are ripping off their work on social media. And you could say this is also a direct result of not having access to these traditional court systems and processes. Um, but I think what we've seen, especially over the last year and few months, is this calling out approach on Twitter, in particular when it comes to copyright infringement relating to NFTs. It still sort of seems to be considered the most cost-effective avenue, um, especially for artists. But I'm going to say, this is the lawyer in me, it is a very risky avenue. Um, and it's risky because what an artist might think is protected by IP is not necessarily what the law thinks as well. And um, if you make threats of copyright infringement against somebody who actually has a legitimate um, um, reason for what they're doing, essentially, and in the eyes of the law, then then you can actually be countersued for that as well. So it, it's a cancel, you know, the cancel culture approach, the very risky approach. But we have noticed this evolving trend, especially on Twitter, with NFTs and copyright in, infringement. Um, and I, you know, if you think about like, why it's actually become so powerful, um, I think it's really just because. It can be so damaging to one's public profile, you know, and in particular, it's something that companies are really concerned about because it affects their reputation. And, you know, without a trustworthy reputation, it's very hard to maintain loyalty with your users. And that is still a very relevant concept in the metaverse in, in where, where effectively, um, you know, platforms really rely on their communities for support and for their longevity. Um, there's an interest, you know, for those that are um, interested in these kind of copycat um, issues, there is a really interesting digital art platform called Steven Arts, and they created this free copyright detecting AI to, to actually help artists to um, find um, examples of where their work has been misused on NFT platforms. So that's probably worth checking out. Um, and what else have we got? So we've got social media, I think, digital rights management um, and dispute resolution protocols. So um, dispute resolution protocols, I'll just, I'll just finish on, on, on this point. And that's to say that when it comes to DAO specifically, um, we've seen some quite interesting models coming up for dispute resolution in the context of, of DAOs and, DAO, and the communities behind DAOs. Um, and so one of them is called the Aragon Court. Um, and the Aragon Court, it basically markets itself as a plug-in arbitration platform uh, that's accessible to any decentralised application um, and it prides itself on being this you know decentralized dispute resolution protocol that can ha handle subjective disputes that can't be resolved by smart contracts alone because you've got to remember that when it comes to smart contracts and automated decision making of DAOs it's not very good when you need suggestive decisions to be made it's only good when you can very clearly set out the para para parameters of the decisions to be made on an objective basis and yeah yeah so this this Aragon court they have this kind of network of guardians that they that you know are ready to arbitrate on a ruling so so yeah so there's this interesting alternative dispute resolution protocols that that are evolving and i think that's another really um um interesting space that we'll see evolve over the next few years super fascinating um and I was just wondering, you know, you mentioned that the contract can be used as a tool, right? And trying to figure out how one wants to organize one's practice around the creation of a new work. So with these different avenues for enforceability, um, is this something you're suggesting to kind of include in the contract as 
avenues for dispute resolution. I mean, probably maybe not social media outing, <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, some of these other yeah. ones, and like, even though they're not clearly, you know, legible within the eyes of the law, like what, how does that kind of configuration work when you have a contract, but then the dispute resolution methods that are listed within that contract um, are not recognized by the law as such? Well, I mean, it's interesting because most standard, well-drafted contracts these days that are designed to be legally binding, A, they will have a dispute resolution clause. So I guess it's the first step. Make sure there is a dispute resolution clause in your contract, which actually governs what happens if there's a dispute between the parties. Um, and, and two, what we see in, in the most common forms of contract today is that um, in these dispute resolution clauses, Basically, the parties to the contract have to make an effort to resolve that dispute. Um, so, you know, your dispute resolution clause can say things like the parties will meet to discuss the dispute or to have representatives from the parties meet to discuss the dispute. So it's literally just spelling out the process that you would want to be followed if there's a dispute with the idea that at the end of the day, you would want to resolve that um, dispute. So, so again, yes, contract, it's our tool, it's our way in which we can plan for what's to come. Um, and of course, it's impossible to predict everything that's going to happen in the future. But you can really, you know, especially when it comes to contracts and the arts, I think there's so much more we can do to, to plan for and support artists when they're creating new works and um, circulating them in, in the metaverse. Okay. No, amazing. Thank you so much, Lana. This has been super useful. I've learned a lot. Um, I guess before we open up for questions, um, I just wanted to ask you about how do we get to the contract stage, right? Because contract is already sort of a consolidation of a specific thought process that requires some kind of legal grounding or understanding of uh, what you need to do in order to arrive at a contract. So for, I guess, for artists who are kind of just starting out in this space, what would be your advice? Like, where do you start if law is not really a language that you speak? Um, yeah, what would be like a step one? Well, I think, um, you know, there's lots of nonprofit organizations around the world that are focused on educating artists about the law and so if you look for it those resources are there mm. uh, and sometimes it's just a simple google away um, but so in the U uk for example you have the institute of art and law um, which has lots of resources when it comes to legal issues and and the arts um, you've got DAX, your, um, your copyright um, society, which also has lots of really useful resources for artists. Um, I think, look, if in doubt, the Serpentine Legal Lab is here. And if you get in touch with us, we are more than happy to point you in the right direction. I always say that I'm more than happy. You know, I'm a, I'm a lawyer authorised to advise on Australian law only. Um, but I'm always happy to point you in the direction of a lawyer in your jurisdiction who is familiar with um, not just art, but, you know, contemporary art practice um, and, and contemporary art practice that uses multiple mediums, formats and, and collaborate as well. There's no shortage of interesting art oriented lawyers out there. <laughs> Good to hear. Okay, well, I think on this note, uh, we can open up for questions. Yeah. Um, I had a quite specific question from a user in relating to a VR work, Alana. Um, so I'm going to read it out. I don't know how it best connects to the discussion so far, but I'm sure you'll, you'll navigate that quite clearly. Um, but Katri Katrina S. says, I have a practical question. We were about to shoot several art projects and interviews with artists in the metaverse for a public broadcaster in Germany. Currently planning to film in VR chat and trying to figure out the permissions for shooting. It's kind of clear that we need permission from the platform itself, VR chat, and the creators of the works uh, and creators of the world slash artworks we were interviewing. But what happens once we take a walk through the open virtual worlds and use avatars created by others? Does everything fall under the copyright? And 
do we need permission for each of the creators of literally everything we are filming? So quite in depth, but <laughs> wow, that's quite like a, applicable. <laughs> Thank you so much for this question. But it's good. It's good to get specific. I think what also this question shows just the level of complexity there is when it comes to what may on the surface seem like a fairly straightforward project. But yeah, Elana, do you have any kind of uh, suggestions on approach in this context? Well, often my first port of call when dealing with online content is looking at the terms of service of the website that's hosting that content. So in this case, I guess we could be looking at the, the host or the provider of the virtual world and looking at what their terms of service say about um, how a user can use the content that they come across in that virtual world. And so in a way that's um, kind of, it's not just an intellectual property issue. It's again, getting back to a contract issue because that terms of service is the contract between the user of that website and, and the host of that website. So, you know, if I'm using a website and I'm creating my own uh, avatar in the virtual world that's effectively you know, built or started by that website host. Um, whatever the terms are, there'll be license terms in there which say who can and can't use that. So I think that's probably a good first port of call. I mean, something else to be mindful of is unfortunately though, the website term use and not your be all and end all. Um, you know, especially with new innovative projects that are doing exciting things. Um, you know, legals are not necessarily, unfortunately, the first thing that the um, creators want to think about. And so sometimes you might find that the website terms of use are kind of lacking or don't provide, you can't even find the website terms of use. And unfortunately, that's just not good enough. And, and I think that, you know, the users are the ones that, that lose out on that. Uh, but you can at least, you know, uh, yeah, in, in, in this situation, I'd probably say, have a look, see what you can find, see if there are any terms governing um, the users of that virtual world. Um, I think that'd be a good start. Cool, thank you. Alex, do you have any other questions? We've got lots of questions. Great. The next one comes from Gassama Fogg, and uh, this is going back to the AI points that were towards the end, but maybe more of a commentary, but still a question. Surely the development of all these new prompt-driven AI image gener generators are going to throw a massive spanner in the works. I've already seen people using ArtStation or DeviantArt usernames as prompts to generate a, a certain aesthetic style in these images. Just wanted to get your thoughts on this, Alana. Yeah, well, so, I mean, we covered these patent cases, which are looking at this idea of inventorship in the context of AI. But really something that's a total a unknown is how in the context of copyright laws, AI is going to be recognised or not recognised. So um, when it comes to copyright law, one of the kind of fundamental principles is that the work needs to be original. Um, what originality, what originality means actually shifts slightly from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but it's arguable that originality actually requires an element of originating from a person or a legally recognised entity. Um, and, you know, actually now that I think about it, in Australia there's a case that it's got nothing to do with the metaverse, um, actually got to do, you know, I guess you could say with web, Web 2, um, it involved telephone books and um, computers that would actually create telephone directories. And it was a question of um, authorship and whether the, the telephone directory could be considered a copyright protected work. And um, this went all the way up to the High Court in Australia and it was actually found that if this telephone directory was not a copyright protected work because it was not original. And it was not original because it was not authored by a human. Um, and so I think we could see that kind of an argument also playing out when um, it comes to, to AI as well. So um, it, it'll take a while, you know, the law always plays catch up in that way, we're not dealing with anything new. Uh, but we can look back and think of ways in which the law has been applied in other contexts and consider if there's anything relevant 
um, and uh, you know the sediment is so. cool. Next question from the brilliant Samantha King. And maybe you can potentially pitch in here a little bit too, Victoria, but it's around creative R&D projects. Um, Often in creative R&D projects, the scope of the final work isn't necessarily clear at the outset of engagement. How do you advise navigating this ambiguity in relation to IP so artists are protected? Do you keep them, do you keep the scope broad? Sorry, my accent. Do you keep the scope it's here? Perfect, Alice. <laughs> <laughs> do you keep the scope here broad? Do you define or do you advise iterating the contract through uh, addendums, etc.? Alana, do you want to answer? And then I have a sort of half an answer, which is not particularly legal, and maybe will be shot down by you as a lawyer. But <laughs> you go first. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll say my first thought is that. Addendums are a pain in the ass and like if you have to rely on addendums, you're just confusing everybody. The more you can consolidate everything into the one document, the better off everybody will be because it's all there in the one document. And yes, of course, things evolve over time. So I guess you're always trying to create a balance between Mm -hmm. planning for what will happen and, and planning for what might happen. So... I don't think that's much of an answer for you. Well, <laughs> but um, actually, yeah, what, what were you going to say, Victoria? Yeah, well, this is also something that I've learned from you, which is uh, the importance of like relationship mapping between stakeholders and tools within complex projects. Um, and although we don't really know, absolutely right, Sam, like we don't know what the final output may be, and that's part of the reason why we're entering into creative R and D process. But we have um, quite a good understanding, right, of the area in which we're operating, the kinds of tools that we will need the types of actors that are involved um, and I think then it's also about getting down to the motivations that are driving the actors involvement in this project and uh, understanding you know both in kind of explicit way what would different contributors want out of this project in terms of the rights that they will derive from this project and what are maybe some of the kind of implicit suppressed and like you know more tense um areas of interest that it's better to uh, have a conversation about in advance rather than, you know, when potential issues could erupt. So if there is, yeah, so I think with this in mind, once there is this kind of mapping of sorts of the relationships, um, motivations, intentions, you know, potential sore points, um, I think it's much easier to draft a contract then. um, And while it might not be possible to speak directly to that final asset, it will be possible to speak more directly to the types of obligations that mutual obligations that all the different actors have towards each other in the course of that project. So I think that's at least how we're trying to (laughs) approach things, although uh, still learning very much. And Elana is helping us on this treacherous path. (laughs) Well, I think you've done a great job at articulating that process that we've been going through, Victoria. And, yeah, it just makes me realise that, you know, at the heart of contracts, it's so much about the relationships of who's involved um, and and what comes of that, what digital assets can be created with that, that that's kind of secondary to those relationships. Do you have any more? I do. Um, <laughs> next question. Lots of questions. <laughs> <laughs> this one comes from how about the, that, huh? Um, are there agencies or people I can ask uh, for advice on this directly? Say I'm making a game, who should I consult? I thought this was interesting given the adjacency with the metaverse and, and yeah. what we do at Serpentine as And well. I guess consult specifically on the legal side of things. A lawyer. <laughs> That's the short answer. What's the longer answer? No, I was going to say, you're asking a lawyer, right? So I'm going to tell you that you should speak to a lawyer. Um, yeah. But really, there's, I, you know, sorry to sound like a broken record, but there's kind of no substitute for good legal advice. Um, you know, it's like if you are physically injured and you need a doctor, you should probably go see a doctor or go to the hospital to be treated rather than, Google your injury and treat yourself. So I would probably advise to use the same kind of analogy when it comes to the legal advice. Um, 
because it does, you know, at the end of the day, legal issues yeah. are super complicated. The law is always evolving um, and it is very fact specific as well. So, you know, often I get asked a lot, oh, can't, can't you just use the template for that? Um, but really a good application of the law is looking at the facts and tuning the you know the, the the contract to the actual facts before you so that's really what a lawyer helps you do and i think you know look i'd understand that um you know when it comes to legal advice there is a stigma around it because traditionally the costs are extremely high and you know what there are many law firms out there that will charge you an absolute arm and a leg for that legal advice but there are many other smaller players mm. as well. We're really seeing a kind of a diversification of who, you know, the types of lawyers that offer legal advice and the types of services they provide as well. So don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to 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 look for a lawyer that specialises in the arts because they're also, they understand the industry that you're operating in and they understand the, the, the financial um, difficulties of what it means to be to be a practicing artist. Next question. Yeah, <laughs> let's go. Um, I'm going to reel it back a little bit. I sort of pseudo answered this in the chat, but I wanted to highlight it given its connection to the previous legal lab report. Uh, but Designer Bird said uh, it feels like we need to understand what we were doing before we do it. In, when we when using new technologies, would Alana say that we all need a mini course and what to do? As a creative, we want to make money, <laughs> understandably. But I, I guess the the short question to that is: um, sh Would you advise on taking a mini course as an artist or a creator, or, or what type of resources are available freely in this type of field? So, but we're talking yeah, about I mean, resources, the, yeah. Correct. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. You, you probably answered the question better. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and something that I think would also be great is if tertiary institutions, um, art schools actually provided um, a little bit more legal education mm. than many of them already do. Um, a lot of them might offer, you know, one session on legal considerations in your art practice as part of your entire three-year degree. Um, even though these legal considerations are something that come up on a day-to-day -day basis, whether you uh, want to think about them or, or not. So, so there are many courses you can do. So again, in, in the UK, um, um, there, um, the um, Institute of Art and Law does provide mini courses and it's not specific to lawyers as well, mini courses around art and law. Um, and there are lots of other, you know, even Christie's has an art law course. There's lots of options. There's also a lot of options now when it comes to looking at the metaverse and the law as well. And I'm seeing more and more courses and one-off online events pop up around, you know, NFTs and the law. Um, so, you know, it's, it's kind of like what they say, do your own research. You can't expect that when it comes to law, it will just come to you, you've got to do your own research. It's out there if, if you want it. Yeah, and you can always get in touch with wonderful Alana, <laughs> who will provide feedback and advice in terms of where to look. Um, okay, so we're at time. Thank you so much, Alana. Thank you everyone else for tuning in. Um, as I said in the beginning, we'll be continuing with this series. In order to stay up to speed and get updates, please sign up to our R&D platform newsletter. You can do that by going on to futureartecosystems.org um, and signing up. Yeah. And in this way, you'll be informed. And we hope to see you all back here for future sessions. Good luck with everything. Bye.